You are listening to the Maastricht Diplomat. In this series of Ducted Art and Cultural Theft, we'll be discussing the debate over the reparations of cultural artifacts held by former colonial powers and the modern fight against illicit trafficking of looted objects. We'll be conducting interviews with experts to discuss their approach to fighting for the restitution of cultural property. My name is Rue Reed, and I am joined today with my co-host, Simon Dilts. In today's episode, Cultural Crime and the Market for Illicit Antiquities, we'll be joined by Professor Donna Yates, an Associate Professor in the Department of Criminal Law and Criminology at Maastricht University, to talk about her research on the global trade of trafficking culture, and in what ways objects are affecting a web of organised crime that connects the theft at heritage sites to the elite market of stolen global art. The idea that two markets operate here, one black and one reputable, is a lie. According to criminologists Simon McKenzie and Tess Davis, these dealers are buying with one dirty hand and then passing the objects to a clean hand in the market. This leaves us with one market, the grey market, that inspires the plunder of cultural objects from the global south to the global north. And the changing of these artefacts that existed as something that was once a shared heritage to something now that lives as a private commodity. The true harm of the illicit trade in cultural antiquities remains that there is a loss of ancestral heritage, history, culture, and identity that comes as a result of the destruction of shared heritage, especially for native communities around the world. Now, we would like to welcome our guest expert, Professor Donna Yates, an archaeologist who is an associate professor in the Department of Criminal Law and Criminology at Maastricht University. In recent years, Donna was awarded a 1.5 million Euro European Research Council grant to study how objects influence criminal networks, with a particular focus on objects such as antiquities, fossils, and rare and collectible wildlife. Previously, she was a senior lecturer in sociology at the University of Glasgow. Donna holds a PhD in archaeology from the University of Cambridge, in which she looked at the legal, social, and political construction of archaeology and heritage in the rapidly changing social and political climate of modern Bolivia. Her research is focused on a transnational illicit trade in cultural objects, art and heritage crime, and white collar crime. Thank you, Donna, for joining us today. It's an honor and pleasure to have you here. And it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> I'm excited to talk about this subject. So we should start right off with our first question. What exactly is involved in the looting and trafficking of antiquities? Well. A lot, actually. <laughs> As you said in your introduction, um, the, the looting and trafficking of antiquities is sort of a multi-stage chain that connects cultural loss in often very poor areas to consumption and buying and marketization in often rather wealthy countries or at least wealthy spaces in countries. So it's at its most basic level, a question of supply and demand. Demand for the ancient past or demand for beautiful things causes supply to form, um, and there's often no legal means to get these things. Um, thinking about the looting and trafficking of antiquities, I often think of it as easier to see it as being in three parts. There's source, where these items come from, there's transit, how they're moved, and there's market, where they're consumed. In reality, it's all a bit fuzzy, but I think it's often easier to kind of understand the trafficking of antiquities if you break it up into phases like that. Um, do you think that more legislation leads to less trafficking? That's a very good question. <laughs> that becomes a, a fundamental question of law and uh, for criminologists, a, a fundamental <laughs> question of, of, of the entire purpose of studying criminology, perhaps. <laughs> does, does regulating anything change anything? Mm -hmm. And the answer is sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it almost depends on, on what, what your goals are when it comes to creating a piece of, of, of legislation or trying to regulate something. Um, the, the dissident in me goes, no. Um, 
<laughs> but I, I think that that's a bit unfair. I, I think a lot of the work that needs to be done in this field is really taking a sharp focus at what the regulation that we have does accomplish and what it doesn't accomplish. We have a tendency um, to make policy around the protection of cultural heritage um, in a very reactive way. Something really bad happens and we rush to create policy to try to address that particular bad thing happening right then and there, which doesn't necessarily take into account research and so on that's gone in the past and doesn't necessarily anticipate the next threat that we're going to have. So it might be great to make policy that's in reaction to uh, the, the devastating looting of uh, Iraq or Syria at one point in time, but that doesn't necessarily speak to, say, what happened in Yemen what may be happening now in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's, that, that's a problem with reactive policy. Mm -hmm. So um, we can make policy like that. It may just not reduce the trafficking that we have in the future. Mm -hmm. But I see that as kind of the role of academics to be a check on the effectiveness of policy um, and try to influence for more and better policy. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I, I tend to think that our real focus should be in this area is reducing the market, which isn't okay. necessarily a policy question, it's a public relations question. Um, like you, you mentioned just before, this kind of um, three stages of the trafficking, any current international regulation, is it working or is it inadequate to address specifically that middle stage of the trafficking process? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, because uh, if you break it into three stages, um, you can kind of start imagining that different types of people, uh, different types of criminals operate in each of these three stages. So if we're thinking about source, we're thinking about um, when objects are stolen from churches or temples or looted out of the ground at archaeological sites. We're talking about theft. We're talking about physically removing something. When we get to the marketing stage, the, the buying, we're talking about what we could consider white collar crime. We're thinking about uh, laundering items, laundering money. Money laundering is a big hot topic in, in this area. And we're talking about uh, the actions of the elite to shield um, illicit or illegal buying behavior. But you have this kind of in-between phase where, where objects are in motion and people are in motion. And that's kind of where we see often um, the, the appearance of what you might consider traditional organized crime. You, you start seeing a lot of corruption, for example, uh, at borders, among officials, and so on. You see uh, false customs declarations and this other type of crime that isn't really this sort of white collar crime like we think of it, and isn't this really easy to define, you stole something type of crime. Mm -hmm. So not just for antiquities trafficking, but we're talking about art and antiquities trafficking, this middle bit of any type of smuggling is the hardest. Mm -hmm. It's the hardest to detect um, because of objects changing hands, people changing hands, people moving. Um, it's hard to detect because people and things cross borders, so they move into different jurisdictions where mm -hmm. there are different laws and different police officers and different customs agents that don't necessarily talk to each other. Um, and ultimately, you, you, you're dealing with an entire criminal operation that's meant to obscure these pathways. Yeah. So this, this kind of rather static or in one place market and rather static in one place site of theft, it's a completely different ball game in the middle, mm -hmm. which means a lot of our efforts to prevent the, the, the trafficking of illicit objects like this focus very heavily on trying to prevent theft and a, a bit less, but do focus on trying to detect um, criminality in the market. This middle bit is just difficult. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard for police. It's hard for researchers. Yeah. It's hard for everybody. We, we still don't know a lot about what goes on in the middle there. Yeah. So I guess there is this kind of disconnect between also the law and what, what 
you know the idea of what you can do to stop and what actually happens on the ground yeah yeah and and the law changes when you cross a border yeah so exactly. the law here is different than the law here it, yeah this object that you stole in this country once you cross the border into another country it may no longer be an illegal object yeah so that's why we i, I tend to use the term illicit for these kinds of objects because they're illegal here hmm. They're not illegal here, but something bad happened in between. When you were working in South America, did you ever see a kind of reaction to a big event with policy and it didn't work when you were there working in, for the UNESCO sites there? Uh, not so much. Okay. <laughs> um, I, with, I, I've done a lot of work in Bolivia, for example, mm -hmm. um, and one of the sites that I worked at as a regular archaeologist is, as it so happens, a UNESCO World Heritage mm -hmm. Site. Um, but its, its UNESCO status um, didn't really affect its vulnerability to, to various kinds of theft and looting. Mm -hmm. So it's a big, gigantic archaeological site. It's called Tiwanaku. If you're in Bolivia, go visit. It's a great community, a great site. Um, it was the center of uh, a, a civilization that most people mm -hmm. don't know about that existed before the Inca. So pyramids, you've got, yeah. it's got a, everything was there at Tiwanaku. However, where Tiwanaku was particularly vulnerable, as it turns out, was in its conquest era church. Mm. So it, it has this big, huge ancient archeological site, but also a, a church that was built by the Spanish and local people from stones from this archeological site. And it has paintings and other artworks in it from the, the 15 and 1600s, or it might be the 16 and 1700s. Someone out there um, knows this, but <laughs> they'll, they'll be hearing yeah. this going, oh, the only person out there knows that I didn't remember the, the exact date. But um, in recent years, it, it got robbed twice of this kind of colonial era stuff. There's a big, huge fence around the archeological site that is you know, a UNESCO mm -hmm. World Heritage Site. It has on-site guards 24-7. Uh, you know, There's two museums at the site. Mm -hmm. But what got robbed was the church of mm -hmm. the church's art, which mm -hmm. wow. there's demand for, but you're just not quite thinking about it in yes. that way. You think this, this, is, this is the focus of the market, but that isn't necessarily the case. Yes, I remember coming across one of your papers that you, you wrote and you spoke about the cases of the church and it was something that I hadn't even registered would be something that would be part of this antiquities illicit market. Because when you think of this, you you know, you think of like the Paracas textiles or the Benin bronzes or something like this as being mm -hmm. traded or you, you don't think church, <laughs> things from churches, you know, these yeah. artifacts from churches is actually has such a high demand. It's interesting because it's uh, this this kind of church art and sacred art that, that uh, uh, we think about has been very popular in kind of home decorating circles for mm -hmm. the past 20, 25 years or so, maybe even mm -hmm. a little bit before that. And when it comes to not just South America, where, where I work, in, in Europe, uh, European churches are some of the most sensitive heritage sites for theft throughout yeah. Europe. For example, in Italy, um, Italy has one of the largest um, art crime police squads in the world. We're talking tens, I, I think they even have nearly 100 officers focused on this throughout wow. Italy. Um, and they're well known for having amazing archaeological sites. If you look at the statistics that come out of Italy and, and their seizures and their, the thefts that they deal with, it's from churches. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That actually goes into a, another question that we wanted to ask. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> about kind of who are the actors involved in this and in the, involved in also the protection of these heritage sites and what is at stake for them in, in terms of the market, in terms of this illicit trafficking? On one level, the loss of cultural heritage objects is just personally devastating to individuals, but also devastating to, to communities that live around these sites. Um, the heritage objects are um, an important source of pride and identity. Um, at times, we're talking about the living manifestations of gods who have been literally stolen from temples. These are dramatic things that, that their loss um, 
can lead to various types of breakdown in community cohesion, but also just the devastating loss to, to, to personal identity. Um, the, the, the same reason that, that people are attracted to these objects in museums or even buying them, the, the, these objects have power and they're powerful and important to these communities. I mean, some, some of the work that we've done, um, this, this comes out of a paper I wrote with Simon McKinsey, who you mentioned in Nepal. Um, there's a lot to be said for community monitoring of heritage sites. So the, the idea that just community access and community use um, helps protect uh, places. Um, people notice when something changes. People, the community notices mm -hmm. if somebody strange is hanging around. Yeah. So in a way, this is going back to what you were asking about regulation. Does regulation prevent this? Maybe, but community involvement seems to add a layer of protection that you know, uh, adding another law might not necessarily do, or uh, eight other police patrols may not yeah. actually do. So people with real stakes in these sites having continued access and, and having the ability to take control of these sites may offer a lot for protection. Mm -hmm. So, but speaking at a broader level, so more of a, a country level, um, the, the movement of these objects out of these countries and into auction houses, into dealerships, and into, at times, even museums, especially when the thefts are fairly recent, is um, it's a challenge to national sovereignty. It's a massive amount of disrespect, um, both for the cultures of these countries, but of the rule of law in these countries. So we spoke a moment ago that, OK, the theft of this object may be illegal in the country it was stolen from, but once it moves across the border, it isn't necessarily illegal in the next country. That's that's quite a yeah. quite an insult to country one. And country one is uh, chances are usually a country that has that is a post-colonial country. It's a, a country that is, like you said, in the global south. So the the movement of these objects onto the market becomes extremely symbolic. It becomes symbolic of this power imbalance, of this continued domination, of continued control. So you see the return of these objects and seeking the return of these objects become very political very fast. You see politicians in the countries of origins crusading to have the return of these objects. Um, you see what uh, some people have called uh, idle diplomacy, mm -hmm. that um, uh, uh, an object, an ancient cultural object that's been stolen in traffic seems to go back when a prime minister visits that country and is trying to get something else. Yeah. And there's always a photo op with the object yeah. and then some sort of agreement is signed elsewhere um because because of how much power and symbolism they have yeah. the people in co these countries um like to see object returns they like to see their politicians crusading for that but the 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 writing a, a post-colonial imbalance has deeper meaning mm -hmm. and the return of those objects conveys that meaning yeah I know there have been um, also on a supranational level um, many attempts to regulate this somehow legally, for example, with the 2017 Criminal Law Convention by the Council of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, so, Donna, does this even really have an effect, really? Um, I don't want to say negative things. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. Um, so, the. The international conventions that exist in this area um, from starting as early as the 1954 Hague Convention, um, which is focused on protecting cultural sites in times of armed conflict, going through to the 1970 UNESCO Convention, which is more or less supposed to be addressing issues of illicit traffic and return. And then, like you said, the, the what's it's called often the Nicosia Convention because it was signed in Cyprus um, or developed in Cyprus. But um, 
that that is meant to kind of harmonize criminal sanctions so the criminalization and criminal response to these kinds of issues i think on the positive side they serve a really important purpose which is um to, to get everyone kind of on the same page, to be talking about the same issues, to, to re reduce or completely eliminate the possibility that can, anybody could say, I didn't know this was wrong, I didn't know this was illegal, I didn't know that this mm -hmm. had you know, bigger issues to deal with. However, <laughs> um, the particular you convention you brought up, even though it was developed in uh, 2017, has been um, signed and implemented by almost no one. Very few countries. I don't know what the exact number is now. It may be five. Wow, um, okay. It, it's, <laughs> it, it could be higher than that. I haven't checked who's been signing it lately. Yeah. That kind of low uptake and very slow uptake um, means that the the direct effects of the convention, that convention or any convention, are, you know, not that great. The 1970 UNESCO convention has a lot more buy-in, but mm -hmm. it's had 50 years to gain buy-in. So that is really meaningful to to have mm -hmm. so many uh, countries speaking on the on the same page and so on. Um, but as something that has a direct and meaningful effect, I, I don't think that effect is so direct. I think it's a good conversation starter. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to directly criminalizing these actions, it really does come down to what, what country the object came from, what country the object ended up in, and what countries they passed through, and what the local law is. I commend that effort, and I don't want to be seen as, as not commending that, because I, I, I think that the, the, the spirit behind that and other conventions is in the right place. Maybe yes. it just needs these conventions to start the conversation, as you Absolutely. said, in order to make more of an impact locally. And, and Eventually, um, countries do buy on to conventions. Sometimes it takes a while. Um, famously, the UK very recently signed the 1954 Hague Convention. So 1954, but they did. <laughs> and it, it, but it, it, because the conversation and discourse around conflict and heritage in Iraq and Syria moved in such a way that people who had been wanting to campaign for the UK, signing this for a long time, they were able to effectively do it. So just yeah. because not a lot of people have signed the, the Nicosia <laughs> Convention yet doesn't mean that they won't. It, it means that the foundation is there to have those kind of conversations. Yeah. But overall, this is a good way to go, you would say. Um, this is a good approach, even if it takes that long. It's an oh, approach. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, all right. I, I, again, you're, you're speaking, you're not speaking to a lawyer, you're speaking to a criminologist. <laughs> so I'm more likely to be studying that approach and just watching it happen. Um, but I, I think the more, like I said before, more effective, immediately effective approaches have to do with making, making the, the, reducing the market, making the market less an appealing place to mm -hmm. to be, making the collection of something stolen from a temple or church just not something you want to have around your house. Yeah. So it's it's a far more social approach than it is a regulatory approach. What I'm interested in is finding ways to make it so people don't want to be seen as the type of person who has something stolen from a Bolivian church or a Nepalese temple sitting yeah. in their house. Yeah. yeah. I, I want the the their dinner party to be ruined as everybody goes <gasps> Yeah. That, that's the reaction. <laughs> yes. As they think of the community. It's so much more effective than trying to criminalize something, I think, because people sometimes react to the law, but they absolutely react to peer pressure. Definitely. I think it's it's definitely a way that hopefully in the next couple of years um, we're going to see more social media campaigns and they they have absolutely they picked helped. up yeah the, the just just kind of comparing to uh when i started working in this field in like the 
the early days of barely social media existing. I'm not that old, but <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the 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 amount of online um, activism and like the creation of online communities around this topic is just huge, and the 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 level of public discussion of this has just exploded because especially when we're talking about objects in museums we we tend to just assume that they belong there it's like the indiana jones it belongs in a museum trope mm -hmm. where every archaeologist goes does that i think that probably belongs in the local community <laughs> um <laughs> but um the, the 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 regular visitors to museums and so on they they assume that these objects are there for a reason that they should be there and that's not necessarily the case it could be that they're there for you know dark and terrible colonial reasons it could be that the thing was literally stolen five years ago mm -hmm. and somehow managed to get itself to the museum in that time which absolutely still happens it's mm -hmm. it's quite remarkable that that's still possible um but it is. <laughs> um, and the, the realization that something doesn't just appear magically in the museum, that these objects in the museum probably weren't excavated by archaeologists is mm -hmm. often rather shocking yeah. and can really change the way people think about it. Um, it also, I, less so now because we're still in a pandemic, but we're in a period of a significant amount of more mobility for people. So mm -hmm. the argument that we need this museum of all of these cultural objects, so we, it's always people in the global north, mm -hmm. yeah. can see the, the manifestations of human culture here, it's, it's a little... It's a, it's a little hard to buy when people can easily go on holiday to Bolivia, for example. Everyone should go to Bolivia. Yeah. <laughs> Visit Tiwanaku. <laughs> I'll sell Bolivia here. Yeah. But you, again, you, you don't, you, you, the argument that that's the only way for people to be exposed to this culture is incorrect. There are traveling exhibits, the internet, you can look at it all on the internet. Yeah. The idea that these objects physically have to be in this space it just doesn't, doesn't really hold up anymore yeah. and do you think in the wake of all of this we're going to start seeing some requests for reparations to actually start taking more hold i or? think so it, it's slow going but there there uh, there have lately been such interesting returns of cultural objects um large collections being returned by collectors who've been pressured by the authorities to do so um, for various reasons mm -hmm. and ways, but we're talking very big collections going back. Um, and uh, there's also been instances of um, countries of origin um, like lobbying for the return of cultural objects m much more successfully than they have been able to in the past. Mm -hmm. Courts will hear them in an interesting way and um, museums are better prepared to hear these requests and to deal with them too, and to give them the, the, the recognition that they deserve. So uh, there, there has been a change in, in that sense. Yeah. Oh, that's really good. That's hopeful. Hopeful <laughs> way. Hopeful. 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 Yes. Hopeful. Yeah. And now, Donna, we also wanted to talk about um, modify artifacts. So how are artifacts modified and redesigned in order to satisfy the international market? Oh, that's an interesting question. So you mean like <laughs> like falsifications and changes? Yes, and exactly. Oh, I could talk about that all day. <laughs> no one's ever asked me that question. I love that question. Well, <laughs> what, I'll, what I'll do is I'll tell you, I'll tell you about Maya pottery. Mm -hmm. So I, I absolutely love the ancient Maya. I know I've been talking about Bolivia, but the Maya's heartland is in Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. We're talking temples in the jungle. It's where I did my first archaeology work, um, and I always like to come back there. Um, <laughs> but um, a very appealing, um, now marketized project product on the market since the nineteen around the nineteen seventies onward are Maya painted vases and other vessels. So the Maya were a literate culture. They had books. 
Um, all but four of those books were burned and destroyed, so we have four Maya books left, that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have these vases that have scenes of, of great Maya things writing on them. They were the only literate culture of the America, so we can read their actual words. They're all on these vases. Mm-hmm. They're beautiful, the market loves them, and so on. Um, so as the market for Maya vases started exploding, as it turns out, um, low-level looters were very connected um, to, to uh, an understanding of what the market wanted. So there's been some glorious research done by a Guatemalan researcher named uh, Sofia Paredes More, who um, did all sorts of ethnographic field work with people who are looting sites um, for these types of vases. And um, she found that they, they, they knew the value of a vase that had a human figure on it or a write, writing on it and so on. If something wasn't decorated enough, they might just leave it because they knew all the way in the United States or Europe where the demand was that one had more worth than the other. Okay. Fast forward to the intermediaries, the, the middlemen, and I, I don't want to gender it, but you know these guys are actually men. I, I know exactly the people I'm talking about. These are some men. These middlemen um, are, are quite aware of this too. Mm-hmm. And so you're finding all of these blank Maya vases, right, that don't mm-hmm. really have anything on them, but they're the, they're the right vase. What could we do to increase our profits? Well, the answer is to learn how to paint some ancient Maya vases. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so there's, there's an interesting thing in this kind of corpus of Maya vases, of vases that have had stuff added to them to appeal more to the market. So a lot of this was done in the United States, like add a new figure here, get really good at painting Maya type stuff, mm-hmm. um, enhance things. If this looks a bit bad, add a little bit more and so on. Um, to the point where sometimes there's argument whether this vase is a true Maya vase to teach us about the Maya culture or it's what some guy in Florida made up. <laughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> and then there, there are, because these have entered into museums, um, you end up with these really weird situations where you're looking at a Maya vase in the catalog of a museum and they say, this is a fake made by that guy in Florida. Yeah. So it becomes part of the history yeah. of the piece. Like this is, this, is, this is a fake made by this guy mm-hmm. comparable to the fake by this guy in this other museum. <laughs> There's, there's a really great term. There's um, Elizabeth Marlowe, who's a, a person who researches mostly uh, classical stuff, Roman stuff. Um, the title of her book is called Shaky Ground. And um, she talks about how the looting of classical antiquities and uh, the fact that we don't know where these objects came from creates a shaky ground that all scholarship is based on. We're making these assumptions about the ancient past but really the foundations are terrible. There's no foundation there because we don't have this core knowledge. Mm-hmm. So at the, these objects that have been modified that sometimes we can tell are partially faked, are half faked, half not mm-hmm. faked, create this shaky ground. Um, it, often a lot of these additions are clearly appear to appeal to a modern market. So you get, um, uh, often like very sexual themes that, that tends to appear. It's, it's, you can kind of predict yeah. what they want. Or just anything that we currently think is quintessential of the culture, but the culture didn't think it was quintessential of itself. Well, thank you so much for your answers to our questions. We actually have one last one. Okay. We came across a recent blog post of yours where you shared that you were serving as an expert witness, witness in a case somewhere about something and i'm guessing you still can't say anything no (laughs) (laughs) but we wanted to ask um what your thoughts are about the relationship between research and the criminal courts yeah Yeah. i i my my thoughts are growing (laughs) no i can't tell anything more about this case yet because it is absolutely certainly ongoing Um, but it does concern an object that was seized coming from a, a second country to a third country, so not coming from its original uh, country of origin. And it's very likely that it left its country of origin 
um, as far back as maybe the 1950s or 60s. Wow. It's a little bit unclear. The thing is, this is talking about lines and and mm-hmm. boundaries and so on. Mm-hmm. When it was leaving, when it was in country number two, it wasn't violating the laws of country number two. But when it entered country number three, it potentially violated the laws of country number three okay. because it left its original country legally. Yeah. Complicated, yeah. obviously. <laughs> and it harder because I can't say any yeah. more about it. Um, but that that particular bit of research, that, that ability to say, you know, what the law of that particular country was at the time mm-hmm. and how the law interacted with this physical object and, you know, who was touching the mm-hmm. object, how and why, and then what happened after it, as well as kind of understanding this, these deep, most likely scenarios for the the trafficking of the object and so on. Um, that's, that is where the expert comes in in courts and that's where they're invaluable. Mm-hmm. So uh, a lawyer who is a great and glorious lawyer whose job is to um, deal with a seizure or a criminal case around these things, um, they, they may be great at that, but this deep expertise of understanding both the ancient culture and the local mm-hmm. law and the weirdness and the social weirdness mm-hmm. around that is important. But I suppose that's where I can say like an, another th- big thumbs up to, to somebody, but a really great example of how you can have expertise within the criminal law system around this, uh, we can see in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Mm-hmm. So the Manhattan, Manhattan District Attorney's Office has a whole group, a whole unit of um, dedicated antiquities trafficking analysts. I think there's over five of them at this point, and that is their full-time job. It just happens to be that the uh, assistant district attorney um, is very interested in this topic. He, uh, this is uh, Colonel Matthew Bogdanos. He was very famously involved in um, the aftermath of the looting of the Iraq Museum. Um, so yeah. he, he loves this topic. And he, he was able to hire this group of people with a significant amount of expertise in this type of provenance research and understanding how the laws around antiquities work. And the result is well, they're at the center of these big returns that I just talked about. They're the ones who are um, able to get, for various reasons, um, collectors to return a lot of objects very quickly to avoid other criminal prosecution and so on because they can do this sort of in-depth research. They're they're more academics than anything else. Yeah. Some of them are my former students, so I like them a lot. <laughs> but um, but that, that interplay between expertise and the criminal justice system isn't, isn't just for this area. It's kind of for all areas. Mm-hmm. This kind of deep understanding and knowledge that you, you can gain about a particular area is just vital for the courts mm-hmm. because they, the, the court can't be an expert in any, everything. So... Yeah. 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 Well, it was super, very interesting. Really interesting. <laughs> yeah. When we came across the post, both of us were like, oh, "What? Yeah. What is she about talking sentence? about?" <laughs> oh. Hopefully, hopefully, one day I can talk yeah. about that case. But of course, it's a pending case, and it could be resolved in any number of ways. Yeah. So, um, Donna, thank you again very, very much for being with us today, and. Um, we just wanted to say that you also have a blog, which is anonymouswisscollector.com, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, we invite all our listeners to have a look. There's also this very, very interesting blog post we just talked about on it yes. and many other things. Um, and yeah, stay tuned for the next episode where we will be discussing the current status of replicating artifacts by the Dutch government and Dutch museums back to their countries of origin. This episode was written and hosted by Rue and Simon. Thank you to Professor Donna Yates for participating in this episode. The music was done by Stone Ocean and the audio technician was Brendan. The camera operator was Sherelle with assistance from Jonathan. The executive producer was Rue. This podcast was brought to you by the students of UNU Merit, the United Nations University here in Maastricht. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Spotify, Apple Music and Amazon Music.
You've been listening to The Maastricht Diplomat.